John. Now you. Oh, well, thank you. And what are you doing? Yeah, John, John's important, too, but he'll wait till next week. <laughs> Happy Father's Day, everybody. I don't do this very often, but I thought if it's all right with you all that I'll um, give you a message today so that Jim doesn't have to. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't have a prayer. You want to pray? Yeah. Do you have a scripture? Not really. There's some in my in my That's okay. stuff here. Let's pray. Father God, may the words of our mouths, <laughs> may the words of my mouth and the, you finish it, thank you. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be holy and acceptable to you, O oh Lord. Amen. Amen. Sorry, did she throw me off? <laughs> I did. If I told him, it wouldn't have been a surprise. So, um, I'm going to take my coffee and enjoy. Take your coffee and sit down. <laughs> Can you hear me? I'm not as loud as he is. Um, the first thing I wanted to say was about Father's Day and, and where it came from. The first Father's Day was celebrated in uh, 1909 in Spokane, Washington. And a lady there named Sonora Dodd had listened to a Mother's Day sermon earlier the month before. Well, it wasn't in June, actually. She had heard a Mother's Day sermon, and she thought that fathers needed to be recognized the same. So she um, talked up having a special Father's Day and the folks in the town, the authorities or whatever in the town decided that that was a good idea. They accepted it and um, so the June 19th of 2010 um, was designated as the first Father's Day and there were sermons honoring fathers that were preached throughout that city on that day. And the newspapers across the country had a story about that. And um, so in, I think it was 1966, Lyndon Johnson proposed that Father's Day be made, um, set on the third Sunday in June and be a national holiday. Well, it wasn't signed into law until 1972 by President Nixon. But, um, my point with, with this was the woman who, Sonora Dodd, was a Methodist. So Father's Day was started by the Methodist, and her church was called um, Central Methodist. It wasn't united at the time. And then on the other side of the country, in West Virginia, there was another church who also eventually changed its name to Central Methodist, and they had celebrated Father's Day the first year that Miss Dodd proposed it was their second year and then when they actually had Father's Day on, the, on, on 1910 that was West Virginia's third Father's Day but their Father's Day didn't get um, any press because in the, t let me see where their town was, Monaghan, um, West Virginia, they had had a big 4th of July celebration and um, during their celebration um, they had watched, let me find it, they had watched somebody oh, ride um, their devil, roll atop a ball on top of the bank building and a spiral staircase, and that made all the news, not their Father's Day celebration. <laughs> and also that same day, one of their church members, a woman in their church, um, passed away with I think it was typhoid fever. So, um, yeah, with typhoid fever. So all those two events overshadowed their Father's Day. So they, they conceded that Miss Dodd had the idea and that it was more publicly accepted, her idea, because nobody knew about West Virginia. And they, um, they said that they would concede that it was her idea, but they wanted everybody to know that they had beat her to the punch that they had had Father's Day for three years in a row when she had just started the first one. <coughs> um, 
And, and apparently West Virginia Methodists love their parents more than the rest of us because they did that for three years in a row. Um, okay, and then I have a little message um, for Father's Day. And these are not my words. This um, was a sermon preached in 2009 um, from a Christian church in Illinois by um, Scott Bales. Um, I already said Happy Father's Day, but there was one time um, somebody asked a little boy um, to explain Father's Day. And he said, well, it's just like Mother's Day, only you don't spend as much on the present. <laughs> So that's a joke, of course, but Father's Day never seems to be as big a deal as Mother's Day. It doesn't seem like it. On Mother's Day, there's higher church attendance usually, and mothers sometimes have corsages and emotions run high. People all go to mom's house to pay um, tribute and honor to the hand that rocked the cradle. Um, and then... Um, Telephone company says that Mother's Day is the day when the most telephone calls are made. But the flip side of that is Father's Day is the day when they make the most money because apparently Father's Day is when more collect calls are made than any other time. <laughs> and I thought about that. I thought, well, I don't even know if we make collect calls anymore, but I know what they are. Um, so, um, I already told you about Miss Dodd sitting in church listening to the Mother's Day sermon and coming up with Father's Day. So, I'm glad there is a Father's Day. It gives us a chance to honor those who stand at the helm and gather the team in a huddle and lead their family through life's battles. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I thought it would be appropriate today for us to take a thoughtful look at Joseph who was the stepfather of Jesus for Father's Day. The cast of characters associated with the story of Jesus' birth is colorful and memorable, and we often recognize them by their unique speaking parts. With dramatic words, the angels took center stage and announced the birth of Jesus. Um, they, they appeared to Joseph to announce the name, the child, the name of the child, Gabriel makes an unforgettable announcement to Mary. <clears throat> an angelic choir interrupts the shepherd, singing glory to God in the highest and peace on earth, goodwill toward men. That's in Luke 2.14. Mary, whose divine selection humbled her, offers a beautiful hymn of praise and thankfulness <clears throat> in Luke 1.46-48. The wise men are desperate in their search to find the newborn king, and they prepare to present him with gifts of honor and worship. The shepherds became early evangelists, telling everyone they saw about the newborn Messiah. Oddly enough, only Joseph has no speaking part. Now this week I read a book about how Jesus chose the disciples, and I never thought about it before, but uh, some of the disciples never spoke, or were never told that they spoke in the Bible. And so when I saw this, I thought, well, yeah. Joseph doesn't say anything. Um, he, is, he is the long, silent member of the cast and is often forgotten. Angels bring heavenly greetings. Mary sang a praiseful solo. The wise men worshiped. The shepherds preached. Joseph is silent. No notable lines are attributed to him. No sound bites, no quotes, only silence. However, as people sometimes say, actions speak louder than words. Joseph is irreplaceable in the story of Jesus' birth, and through his silent actions, Joseph teaches us three valuable lessons in fatherhood. First, a lesson in righteousness. We're introduced to Joseph in the middle, he's in the middle of a personal crisis. Having become engaged to a beautiful young girl, he's worked hard to establish an income to support his new bride and begin his family. He's in love. He's committed to Mary. He believes she loved him, that is, until he hears the news that his precious bride is pregnant. He's heartbroken and betrayed. 
How should he respond? Should he publicly shame her? Should he turn her over to the authorities to be stoned to death? Her explanation of the pregnancy was unbelievable. Even blasphemous. If Mary hadn't been stoned on the charge of adultery, she could have been stoned on the charge of serious blasphemy. But Joseph chose a path of mercy. The Bible says that Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. Matthew 1, 19. Before any divine explanation, Joseph chose kindness and discretion. No malice, no explosion. Certainly he could have asked a lot of questions. How could you do this to me? Who's the father? But no words are recorded. Only tenderness. He might be the talk of Nazareth. Friends might make snide comments. But he would not hurt Mary, no matter what he thought she had done to him. When he could have demanded a bitter sentence, he chose grace and mercy. Another translation said, Joseph, her fiancé, was a good man and did not want to disgrace her publicly. That was from the New Living Translation. The first key to being a good father is first being a good man. James Dodson has often said one of the best things a father can do for his children is to love their mother. That's what Joseph did. Even when he thought that she didn't love him, he loved Mary. Um, recalling a childhood bit of nostalgia, a man said, once when I was a teenager, my father and I were standing in line to buy tickets for the circus. Finally, there was only one family between us and the ticket counter. The family made a big impression on me. There were eight children, all probably under the age of 12. You could tell they didn't have a lot of money. Their clothes were not expensive, but they were clean. The children were well behaved, all of them standing in line, two by two, behind their parents holding hands. They were excitedly jabbering about the clowns, elephants, and other acts they would see that night. One could sense they had never been to a circus before. It promised to be a highlight of their young lives. The father and mother were at the head of the pack, standing proud as could be. The mother was holding her husband's hand, looking at him as if to say, you're my knight in shining armor. He was smiling, basking in pride at her. The ticket lady asked the father how many tickets he wanted. So he proudly said, please let me buy eight children's tickets and two adult tickets so I can take my family to the circus. The ticket lady quoted the price. The man's wife let go of his hand. Her head dropped and the man's lip began to quiver. The father leaned a little closer and asked, how much did you say? The ticket lady again quoted the price. The man didn't have enough money. How was he supposed to turn and tell his eight kids that he didn't have enough money to take them to the circus? Seeing what was going on, my dad put his hand in his pocket, pulled out a $20 bill, and dropped it on the ground. Keep in mind, we weren't wealthy in any sense of the word. Then my father reached down and picked up the bill, tapped the man on the shoulder, and said, Excuse me, sir, I believe this fell out of your pocket. Of course, the man knew what was going on. He wasn't begging for a handout, but certainly appreciated the help in a desperate, heartbreaking, and embarrassing situation. He looked straight into my dad's eye, took my dad's hand in both of his, squeezed tightly onto the $20 bill, and with quivering lips and a tear streaming down his cheek, replied, thank you, thank you. This really means so much to me and my family. My father and I went to our car and drove home. We didn't go to the circus that night, but we didn't go without. Fathers, that's the kind of lesson, a lesson in righteousness that sticks with your kids. The next lesson we learn is one of responsibility from Joseph. After making his plans to quietly and discreetly divorce Mary, God gave Joseph a glimpse of the divine plan in a dream. An angel appeared to Joseph in his dream and told him, Joseph, descendant of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife because the baby in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Matthew 1, 20 to 21. 
Then the Bible says, When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. But he did not have relations with her until her son was born. And Joseph named him Jesus in verses 24 and 25, also in Matthew. Joseph understood clearly what God expected of him, and he was ready to obey. He would take Mary to be his wife and suffer the cutting remarks of a child received prior to their wedding. He would obey in spite of the fact that this child of divine promise would be born under a cloud of adultery. He called his adopted son Jesus just as he was told to do. Joseph believed God, obeyed God, and accepted the responsibility that God had given him. How much better would our world be if every father did the same thing? In 1960, 17% of children in the United States were raised apart from their biological fathers. By 1990, that number had risen to 36%. Today, nearly half of all the children in the U.S. are raised without a father in their home. How could we have become so irresponsible, so cavalier in our relationships with our own children? Now, don't get me wrong. I don't, I don't know any dads like that because my fatherly picture has always been good, my earthly father and my heavenly father. Um, but we can't leave the rearing of our children to the television or daycare centers or even to a single parent. We need to be actively involved in our children's lives. We need to take responsibility, especially in their formative years. Psychologists say that whenever, whatever you plan on teaching your children, values, morals, etc., must be taught within the first five years. After that, it's just reinforcement. That's an awesome responsibility. The first five years is really all you have to cram it in there. <laughs> um, Bo Jackson, a former pro professional baseball and football player, once said, having grown up virtually fatherless, I know firsthand how much it means to a child to have a caring, loving, involved dad. That's why it's so important to me to really be there for my kids. I want to build self-confidence in my children and make them aware that they have choices, but I don't want my kids to follow in my footsteps. I want them to make their own. Dad, spend time with your kids. Get down on the floor and play with them. Play baseball with them, take them to the park, take them to church. Our last of the three um, virtues is, I guess it's a virtue, religion. Um, Christians, ha it has been said that Christianity is a relationship, not a religion. But yes, it is a, about a relationship with God and his people, but true religion is also about our relationship with God and his people. That's the essence of James' statement. Pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. James 1, 27. James, who wrote those words, was also a son of Joseph and a brother to Jesus. The point is, Joseph was a devoutly religious man. In Jewish culture, the father was not only the breadwinner of the house, and the primary, um, on the head of the house and the primary breadwinner, he was also the spiritual leader for the family. After Jesus was born, Joseph took Mary and Jesus to Jerusalem to have him circumcised. And then the Bible says, after doing everything the Lord's teachings required, Joseph and Mary returned to their hometown Nazareth in Galilee. The child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom and God's favor was with him. Every year, Jesus' parents would go to Jerusalem for the Passover festival, Luke 2, verses 39 to 41. You see, Joseph knew the Lord and his teachings. He obeyed everything in the law of Moses to the best of his ability. Their annual pilgrimage to Jerusalem demonstrates that Joseph was dedicated to seeking God and leading his family into a deeper relationship with the Heavenly Father. Austin L. Sorensen once said, A child is not likely to find a father in God unless he finds something of God in his father. Let that sink in a bit. Seeing God in their father is a child's best way to come to know God as their father. Dads, you more than anyone else in the world are able to instill faith in your children. You more than anyone else are able to show them what a loving father looks like. 
you more than anyone else can give them the ability to trust and depend on their Father in heaven. But you can't give what you don't have. Before your children can see God in you, you have to let God into your heart and into your life. You have to seek him and make him your top priority. You have to love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. When you do, they'll see it. A preacher once asked the preschoolers in Sunday school to draw pictures of God. He intended to use them as an illustration for his Sunday sermon. Towards the end of class, the children were excited to show him their work. They came up with rainbows and men with big hands. Finally, the preacher's daughter showed him her picture, a man with a suit and tie on. I don't know what God looks like, she said, so I just drew my daddy instead. So what do we learn from a man who never said anything? Even though none of his words were ever recorded in scripture, Joseph's example teaches us some invaluable lessons in fatherhood a lesson in righteousness, a lesson in responsibility, and a lesson in religion. To all the righteous, responsible, and religious dads here today, thank you. Thank you for showing us what it means to be a good man. Thank you for always being there when we need you. Thank you for your, lo for your loving God and for making us want to do the same. Whether you are a father or not, whether you had a loving father growing up or not, you need to know that you do have a father in heaven. And he loves you. Amen. Amen. Sorry, I'm a sap. My mother is a nurse and she never cries. She's like this. My father cries. And I must be just, I can't. Because I do it especially when our kids do anything. That lady's turned me a lot, taught me a lot. Cleveland had a cry, so. Uh. I cried a drop of the hat now, too. <laughs> now receive this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.